Hello and welcome. Yeah, I have a microphone now, so I hope you guys can hear me better. I think that's why I have a microphone. I don't really know the reason, but I am going to read chapter three of Doctor the Nazis, and please like, please subscribe, and smash that like button, and I hope you have, and I hope you like all of my edits. So, this is what's the plan. So, there is 27 chapters in the book. So, from now on, I will be reading two chapters in one video. So, it goes shorter. Because it will probably be done by the time I get to Christmas break. So, and then after, I will be doing two videos. One video is going to be, I will be asking you guys to ask me questions about me. And the second video will be a how-to video, like baking uh, hair. I don't know what yet to do, but I'll figure it out. And I will be asking you guys on TikTok, Snapchat. I think that's what I'm going to be asking you guys on. Um, any questions that you have about me. So that's what I'm doing after this book. So today we're going to read chapters three and four of Don't Tell the Nazis. Thank you for li well, thank you for listening. Chapter 3. Chapter 3 is short, so that's good. Chapter 3. Blood and raspberries. My pockets bulged with raspberries and crassa had long finished grazing, but Uncle Rowan still hadn't come back. When I was anxious, anxious to get home, he told me to wait, so I sat down on a rock and chewed on a blade of grass. Crassa ampled over and nudged my shoulder with her nose. Only a few more minutes, I said, rubbing her face, and... Just then, Boots sounded on the road. There they are, girl. I grabbed, I grabbed Cress's rope and let her out. Lisa was there to greet us, but it was Dolik Kita holding onto her rope, not Uncle Roman. Dolik did not look me in the eye, but instead stared down at my feet, my bare and dirty feet. He wore sturdy leather boots. Why do you have my uncle's cow? The words came up more sharply than I intended. She was one. She was wandering down the road. He said, kicking away dirt with a stone. I. It was a good thing I was delivering medicine for mommy down the way. Or Lisa may have been stolen. I took Lisa's rope and thanked him. Then, with one rope in each hand, I turned and led the two cows toward Uncle Roman's pasture. Where is your uncle, asked Dolik. I don't know. I said it wasn't unusual for Rowan, for Uncle Roman to lose track of time, but to lose track of Lisa. Never. That's why I'm going to see if I can find him. Dola caught up with me and took Lisa's rope back. Let me help you. Aren't you worried you'll get your fancy boots dirty? Why do you have to be so mean, Christia? He said, I'm trying to help you. I'm being mean? Two bright red spots formed on Dola's cheek. It's not my fault that my parents have more money than your mother. Stop holding it against me. Was I jealous of Dolik? I had to admit that I was, but it had, it had nothing to do with his boots or his or his, his nice clothing. Every time I saw him with his father, my heart ached. How I wish I could have one more hug from my own father. Tattoo's death had blasted a hole through my heart. I opened my mouth to say something back, but no words came. Worse than that, I could feel tears welling up in my eyes. I brushed my hand across my face and continued walking in silence. Dolik stomped along a meter behind me as we led the cows down the road toward my uncle's pasture. Strangely, even though Dolik unsaid, unsettled me, I was grateful for his company. I was getting more worried about what, ha what had happened to my uncle. We tied both cows to a tree to keep them from wandering, then split up so we could check the entire area calling out uncle's name as we went. The place he most often often sat was on a rock at the edge of the pasture. I like sitting there too because of the view of the roads and farms. I climbed up onto the rock, shouting uncle's name, but he didn't but he didn't, didn't answer. I turned looking in all directions, no uncle Roman. In the distance, I noted the distinctive blue tile on the roof of 
Auntie Paulina Simcoe's farmhouse. She was really an elderly, distant cousin, but my sister and I call her Auntie. I had been at that farm, but I, I was little for our wedding. Most of the land had been taken over by a Soviet commune, but that blue roof never changed. Dolik met back up with me, his brow creased. Let's switch sides and try again. About 15 minutes later, he shouted. I spied him on the rock where I'd stood, waving Uncle Roman's yellow handkerchief like a flag. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. I ran over to him. Uncle Rowan lay curled on his side, deep in the brambles behind the rock. I pushed through, ignoring the thorns as they cut into me. The back of his shirt was a wet slick of blood. Sometimes a shock is so bad that it seems like you're watching your own actions from above. That's how it was for me. I laid my head on Uncle, on Uncle's back and begged him to get up. I think he's dead, Christina said, Dolly, like placing a palm on Uncle's neck. Feel how cold he is. I didn't want to believe it and clung to Uncle Roman's body, begging him to wake up. Dolly wrapped his arms around me and gently pried me away. Take a deep breath. I forced myself to think. An image cried in my thoughts. It was the shoulder soldiers. What soldiers? Half a dozen Soviets passed this way, I said, and I heard shots. But I thought they were shooting into the air. Wow, they shoot an old man looking after his cow. Listen, we need to get the cows home safely, said Dolik. But we also need to get your uncle's body out of here. Dolik was right, but I couldn't think it all through. Can you stay here with them, said Dolik. I'll get help. Go, I said. Dolik nodded and left. Even with Uncle Roman lying dead in front of me, I found it hard to believe that he was truly gone. Poor Br Bros and J Joseph and Aunt Iron, their hearts would be so broken. The, the pain of my own father's death was still as deep as, it, as if it had just happened. And now my cousins and auntie had their own horrible loss. My entire being ached with sorrow. I looked down at my good skirt and shirt both not covered with the red of blood and raspberries. I fell to my knees, hung, hugged Uncle Roman, and wept. Chapter 4 of That of Soup July 1st, 1941. The day ap after Uncle Roman's funeral, I went out to take Krasa to the pasture as usual, but a crowd of people stood in front of our church, hugging one another, laughing and crying. Our neighbor, Valentino Zook, was in the crowd. She noticed me, ran across the road, and wrapped me in her arms. It happened. She said, Ukraine is free. So the Soviets are truly gone? They are, she said. Look at the poster on the church door. It's a proclamation of statehood for Ukraine, independent of Germany and the Soviet Union. I ran back into the house to wake Mama and Maria and tell them their good news. We hugged one another and trod around the bedroom. A ripple of excited cheers erupted. The soldiers continued to light all the soup, and before I knew it, it was my turn. When we got back to our side of the, of the street, Mama, call, call, Mama called. Don't look, Leon, come in and eat with us. Your parents are already inside. The room was crowded. Mr. and Mrs. Seagull were deep in conversation with Mr. Kati and Dr. Mina. Auntie Irina was setting out spoons on the table. On the table, Her eyes were pink and she was very quiet. The excitement of our new freedom was tempered by her loss and not knowing where Boris and Joseph were. And that's when I noticed Uncle Ivan. I hadn't seen him since the Soviets had set fire to his printing shop. He towered over Dr. Mina and his clothing looked rough compared to the beautiful blue shawl shawl. She had draped over her shoulders. I, shot, I set my bowl on the table, then went over to him. There is my favorite oldest niece, he said, giving me a bear hug. I miss you so much, Uncle. I'm glad you're safe. He released me, but held me at arm's length. Your mother tells you what a good help you and Maria are. I'm glad for that. Now let us sit down to this good soup in the company of friends and family. Mr. Coty has set chairs from his own house around our small table. He looked up at me and grinned. The glass from his black rimmed, st rimmed spectacles catching a glint of sunlight from the window. I smiled back at him. If my own father were still alive, would he look like Mr. Cati? 
they, they would have been about the same age. Just then, Maria came in, balancing her bowl of soup. Nathan followed a few steps behind. As I looked around the crowd, our crowded table, I felt almost happy. This was a true celebration. Let us thank God for this food, said Uncle Ivan, and let us thank God for our many friendships. We ate together in happy silence, savoring each spoonful. This was the most food I had eaten in a very long time. Uncle Ivan leaned back in his chair and turned to Mr. Cutty. Herschel, he said, thank you for providing the paper and ink for our posters. My pleasure, said Mr. Cutty. Let me know what you need more. He took me a moment. It took me a moment, but then I understood. Uncle, I said, was it you who printed the posters about Ukrainian independence? Uncle, I ringed. So your printing press is not destroyed? Not at all. Just well hidden. That is wonderful, I said. But we are truly independent. The post had disappeared and the Germans seemed to be in charge. The Ukrainians got to live right after... The Ukrainians got to live right after the Soviets fled and before, and before the Germans arrived, said Uncle Ivan. They seized the radio station and posted signs all over, declaring Ukrainian independence. They still have control of the Livis radio transmitter. So are we free? I asked. Well said Uncle Ivan, it's a ploy. The proclamation was a complete surprise to the Germans, but I don't think they'll be too quick to say anything, because right now the crowds see the Germans as our limiters. We were hoping the Germans will will realize it's their it's in their interest to support Ukrainian independence. And you know the saying, said Mr. Kitty, good things come from the West, bad things come from the East. I listened in silence as the conversation continued. I hoped Uncle Ivan was right, but I couldn't help but feel queasy. These Germans did seem friendlier than the Soviets, and they had given us food and opened up the church. But for all their cleanliness, clean, cleanliness and friendliness, they were still invaders, and their flag was bluttered, just like the flag of the Soviets. I hoped the thing would change for the better. After all, how could the Germans possibly be worse? Ten to five is photograph. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe and hit that like button. Tomorrow I'll be posting chapter six and chapter seven. Thank you for Will Bergman from my school for letting me borrow this microphone so I can use it to help you guys hear me. Please subscribe and please watch my next video. Thank you. Have a good day.